Good, good. Did you did you use the script the way it was written? And and at one point did you say, uh, did you take that read back to me? Okay. How did it feel after you finished? Yeah. Do you feel that if you were to practice this more often, in other words, if you were to do it instead of three, she did. She said that she called three times. Now imagine if you found time to do it three times a day, as opposed to three times a week. And that's not an exa exaggeration, because when I called, I used the app, five calls. And if you notice, on five calls at the bottom, it actually tells you how many people called on the same topic. And if you go back and you pay attention, it actually said 290,000 times. You hear what I just said? Almost 300,000 times. People called on the same topic, which is Gaza, to the three uh, people that are, that, that are listed uh, on five calls. And the question I have in my mind is, Ya Tara, how many of them are Muslims? And you and I know the sad truth that it's probably, the majority of them are probably from the other side. Now, I'm not saying this to depress you. I'm hoping that, that, that by knowing the volume, and realizing that, uh, that, that we probably are not the majority there, that that would encourage some of us to, to do it more and more. And believe me, at one point, you'll wake up, and just like having your cup of coffee in the morning, you'll pick up the phone and say, I haven't called my congressman today. And you would actually call them and say, oh, it's me again. I'm just calling to you know, check and make sure that uh, the congressman knows that I'm here. I'm going to be watching how he votes and what he does. And I'm going to call every single day until the, he shapes up or until we ship him out. Because he works for you. You pay his salary. Anybody else wants to share from the guy's side? Did any of you call? Anybody? Go ahead. No, that's fine. That's, look, there's no judgment here. Wallahi. I'm hoping that somebody who never called, called once, that, that's huge. And then from once you go to second and third and fourth. So we, we just want to break that, that barrier. Go ahead. Tom Kane, yeah, I know Tom Kane personally, actually. Yeah. Cold. Yeah. It really doesn't matter. They're, they're look, uh, they're interns, which means they're there to learn, which means they're not professionals. This is not their job. Their job is to is to take down your words. Okay? And with that regard. I told you what to say. Read it back. If, did, did, did they read it back to you? Yeah. But at least they took some notes. Okay. The question now is, how did it feel after you were done? You did something. Um, all right. All right. Uh, uh, do you think the second time around will probably be easier? Yeah. So you see, th these are young, educated people here. I would assume both of you are college, mashallah, right? Graduated, and graduated, mashallah. So we have post-college people here, and they're calling once or twice. No judgment, wallahi. I'm, I'm just saying. But at least by practicing here in the class for 20 minutes last week, they got the energy to try. Now imagine people who are not college graduates, you know, our moms and our uncles and aunts, and who are not as fluent in English as you are, how they would feel. Folks, that's how we're losing this fight. And if it wasn't for our children who are posting and who are, who are sharing and who are doing everything they're doing, we would be losing the PR campaign totally. But we know from the latest statistics that we are actually gaining and that more and more Americans are actually in favor of the Palestinians 
which is a total shock, especially in the age group under 40. That, that age group, uh, 18 to 40, is right now, a majority of them are with the Palestinians. And that's a good sign. Wallahi, if we spent billions of dollars to try to make that happen using regular advertising means, it probably wouldn't have happened. So my, my request, I don't want to spend more time on it, although it's an important topic. My request is that you do try again. If you tried already, try again. If you did once or twice, do four or six. If you did four or six, do eight. Try to do incremental change. And that brings us to the topic of tonight, the topic we've been in at for a couple of weeks, which is what? What do we call it? Quantum leap. And then we say, what did we say quantum was? What did it mean? Small changes. See, this is not about you walking out of here and your life is all of a sudden perfect. There's nothing else to do. This is about making incremental changes that will hopefully make a difference down the road. So tonight, inshallah, I'm going to introduce you to a new concept that I didn't speak about before. And it's one of the concepts that you need to build a life worth living. Okay? Um, and I, I would hate to be talking about issues like this at a time when a thousand people were murdered today. Uh, I mean, the tendency is let's just keep wallowing in our misery and talking about it. But I refuse to do that. I want us to dust ourselves off and just continue to live as, as, as full a life as we can, while at the same time, our eye is on the situation. So here is, here's the difference between what we're doing and what other people are doing. Watch the board. Now, whether you like it or you don't, you are, on, you are in one of two positions here. Watch me carefully. You are in one of two positions. You are either doing this, observing, and in social science, they call this a moderator, an observer, somebody who's just watching. Okay? So this is called a moderation, or not moderator. And that's where most of the world is. This is where 57 Arab countries are, Muslim countries, and 22 Arab countries are. They're, they're just watching. We're choosing a different option. It's the same situation, where it's active, and something's happening, they're doing something, whether it's dropping bombs, whether it's uh, some phobia, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You can throw the black. They're doing something here, and the difference is you get to sit here. That's your. This is called mediation. A mediator is somebody that comes in the middle. Says, I'm sick and tired of being an observer. I want to be in the middle. But this comes with qualifications. If you can't sit there, choose to be in the middle. Nobody will pay attention to you. All your presence would be insignificant. They'll crush you, they'll bypass you, they'll go over you, they'll step on you, they'll throw off you. There's all kinds of names. Unless you are significant, meaning that you possess certain powers, certain abilities, certain whatever it is, you build yourself up to where you cannot be ignored. You understand? So what I'm trying to share with you here is something that empowers you to mediate the events, to be, to be in the middle, to change things. And that's our deen. We use words for that. We use words like, like da'wah. What's da'wah? You come in between somebody's beliefs and the person. You know, the, the, this person has certain beliefs. He's, he's a mushrik, he's a kafir, he's whatever. And you say, time out. And you start talking to them, and next thing you know, they, they either change or they don't, but you, you put yourself in the middle of the, whole, of the whole process, okay? 
So tonight I'm going to introduce you to a new concept that we didn't talk about before. And it's one of the concepts that are on the sheet here. But uh, I made copies because I know uh, uh, you haven't received your handout yet. So inshallah, maybe by next time. So I made you, uh, I made you copies of the page that I'm going to discuss. So let me have just a few later. Shabbat. So remember, I said to live a uh, a healthy, healthy, wealthy, counterbalanced, harmonious life. You need to have certain disciplines introduced into your life. We touched a little bit on, on each one of them. We spoke about, last week we tried this one, number six. Do you remember number six? The training that we did last week was this one, was the learning based, which meant learning at the highest level, which meant learning by doing. Remember we said you can learn by getting a lecture, by getting the discussion, by, you know, all those steps, one, two, three, four, and then we got to a point where we said somebody wrote models, so I stood here and I said, I'm calling on the, on, on the issue of Gaza, there's genocide going on, I modeled it, then I asked it to rotate it, that's learning at a high level. That's one of the things that you need to master in your life, not just for Gaza, but for your own life. You need to learn how to, how to learn at a higher level. Today, I'm going to go to the next one, uh, to, to this one here, to number five. And that's the one you have here. This is a very, very, very important concept. Uh, it looks complicated on the page, but I'll, I'll, I'll simplify it. So they're here, and they, 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 they want to do something, so they go ahead and, and they do it. Whether it's business, whether it's a uh, uh, person is into sports, so he wants to be a runner, whatever it is that they want to do. So they start from here, entrepreneurially. A long word, but simply means by self-motivation. They are self-driven, self-motivated. That's what drives them. And they go, they do really, really good at some point, and then they fail. What is this point? This is called the person's natural ability. Every one of us has a level of natural ability. What is that? Mean, uh, if you took two, a brother, two brothers and, 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 and you, you sent them to play soccer, somehow one plays better than the other. And you scratch your head and say, why? And there's no explanation. Yeah, you have no idea. What we call that in this, in this arena is the natural ability. One has a natural ability to, to run a five-minute mile, like right off the bat, without any training. The other one couldn't do it in seven minutes. And you have no idea why. So the natural ability changes from one to the other. I could see it in sales. When I was training salespeople, there are some people that are brand new into the business, have never sold anything in their life. And you tell them, teach them a couple of things, here's what you need to do, and they go, and somehow they come back with a sale. They manage to get it done. You send somebody else, and he fails, and fails, and fails. And, and both of them start from zero. One does a little better than the other. Now, if I was to ask you and say, who among them 
is actually in a better position. The one who achieved a level of success or the one who actually crashed and burned? Which one do you think long term is in better shape than the other one? What do you think? That's wrong answer. What do you think? The second one is in better shape. Why do you think that is? You, you probably know the answer, but I want to hear it from somebody else. Why do you think that is? He's saying the one that actually crashed and burned is probably in a better shape than the first one. Why do you think that is? The answer is right, by the way. The answer is right. But why do you think that is? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so let me turn the question differently. Let me say why. Actually, the one who achieved a little tiny success may actually be in deep trouble. What do you think is happening in her mind? I don't want to talk in terms of masculine thing that I only uh, use masculine <laughs> examples. So, so what do you think is going on in her mind once she came back with a sale and she just made money? She's going around saying, hey, look at me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, people who are the biggest obstacle in the way of big success is small success. Pause for a minute and think. People who are natural, most of the times, never grow because they sell themselves a bill of goods. They pat themselves on the back and they say, hey, I'm good. I don't need to learn. Oh, they have special classes for guys like us. I don't need to take that. Didn't you see this? It's a bit a little teeny weeny success that I just accomplished. And they pat themselves on the back and they think they're done. And that's what we call here small success. You're crashing against your natural ability. There's a movie about this. I don't remember the rating of the movie. It came out probably 30 years ago by Robert Redford. And the title of the movie is The Natural. That's the name of the movie, The Natural. And the scene opens up with, with Robert Redford. Um, I'm not sure if it was Robert himself who was young or if Robert was the coach and he was coaching a younger person. But the, in, in, the, in the movie, it opens up with a young kid who grabs, uh, it's about softball, uh, baseball. So he, he he pitches really hard. And they're in a farm, and there is a, there is a, uh, a barn and in, in the background, and he pitches so hard that the ball literally opens a hole in the, in the wall of the barn. I mean, it was just an incredible shot. And the coach goes to him and says, you're in deep trouble. And he said, why? He said to him, you're unnatural. That's somebody who knows. John Wooden, who coached Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Now, these are names from yesteryears. Many of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, but these were the basketball champions of the 60s. Uh, and the, the first thing John Wooden had to teach Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is to get over his natural ability. He even taught them how to put their socks on because if they didn't, they would have blisters. And if they had blisters, if you read the life of John Wooden and how many champions, I mean, he, would, he makes people like, uh, 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 like Michael Jordan and these guys that like they're amateurs compared to John Wooden. John Wooden was, was probably the greatest coach of all times. Uh, he coached at the college level at, and, and, and at, the, uh, at the professional level. So, so the message I'm trying to get to you to, to make sure that you get into your head today is that if you are going to succeed at a very high level in your life, do not let your natural abilities hinder you from seeking to learn at a higher level. And there are steps to follow. This is not just a conversation about me encouraging you to go sign up for a course. There are steps and they are in sheet in front of you. So give me a second. What's the alternative? Of course, there is a, there is a, a question. 
example from the Apollo industry, well, where you, you know, you, you say uh, there's resignation and there's remorse and there's blame and there's deflection and all these things happen until at some point you go right back and start again and you just keep bouncing against your natural ability. The alternative method that will allow you to break through is to switch from the entrepreneurial method to what's called the purposeful method. The purposeful method has steps in it. Okay? The first one we'll talk about in a second is to have options. Well, before that is focus. I mean, you need to have focus, then you have options, model, systems, and accountability. So these five steps constitute together when you follow them, you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. They constitute the purposeful approach as opposed to the natural approach. The natural approach, you don't have to do anything. You just keep running. You're a runner, you just keep running. The purposeful approach is to wake up one day and say, do I really want to be a runner? Because maybe you don't. Maybe it's just a, a phase you're going through. And if you decide that you really do need to, to be a runner, the next question is, who do I know or who can I reach who is a great runner that I can probably emulate. And, and you start digging up examples. So you may find, you know, you talk to a coach here and a coach there, and they tell you, oh, this guy ran like the mar five marathons. This one did this, that one did that. So what do you do? You go seek them out. Minimum three. You may not relate to the example, so I'm... Should I switch to another example that's more? We can pick an example like going to college. Would that, would that maybe work better? Anybody here contemplating going to university, college, high school, anything like that? Okay. So let's use that example. Let's say that you, you, you want to go to a really, really good school. The natural ability is to say, I want to go to college. I just applied to college. And you're done. You pick one, you apply, and you're done. The purposeful approach is to say, what are my options? First of all, you have to ask yourself, do I really want to go to college? Because if, if, you're, if you're not sure, take time, decide. Once, you dis, once your decision is made, then you need to look at options. What are my options? So let's say within, you, you, you want to stay at home, you don't want to dorm. And let's say that there are three, three universities or colleges nearby and you, you pick their names, let's say Montclair, you know, Rutgers, and give me one other one, uh, William Patterson or something like that. So three, three universities. What would be the next step? You go find somebody who goes there, somebody that you trust. So now you have models. How many? Three. Three. And then you go sit down with each one of them, and you talk to them, how's your experience? How was it? Uh, how's the campus? How are the teachers? How, you ask all the questions you need to ask. Once you're done, then you make the decision which one you want to follow. Once you make the decision, you find out what system do you need to have? What SAT score? What, what applications? How much is it going to cost? That's called the system phase. And the last one, you get some accountability in place. You know, your parents or somebody has to look at your report card, hold you up to a certain standard, and so on and so forth. That is the purposeful approach as opposed to the natural approach. In the movie, you'd see that Robert Redford gets this person to practice and practice and practice. Many of you have seen The Karate Kid. I mean, that's a relatively young movie, and many of you have seen it. And you remember Mr. Miyagi telling the kid, whatever's his name, I forgot his name, uh, Daniel Son. Daniel, Daniel's son, wax off, wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off, right? Now this kid is sitting there and say, what the heck is this? Wax on, wax off. He's having him wax all his cars, uh, free of charge. You know, what does he think, I'm stupid? So at some point he wants to throw the towel and just give up. And he goes, J -j 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 Daniel's son. And he pulls him and, you know, Mr. Miyagi, he passed away by the way, rahimahullah. So, so a lot of kids learned from, the, from Miyagi. They learned the concept of development. I think the most important part of that movie, The Karate Kid, 
it, it's not the end result that he finally became a champion. He kicked the guy and, and won and everything. No. Go back and watch it. It's about the methodology, the, the idea of developing somebody from be, trying to be a natural to being a developed person. Okay? So look at the sheet in front of you. What are the characteristics of the entrepreneurial approach? How do you know that somebody is being entrepreneurial? So that you actually look at your, your sister or your friend and you say, oh, you're operating in e-mode. This is actually a language that we used to speak among ourselves 20 years ago when we were building our company. That you would have people in, at, at work, yeah, Sufyan and Leith, my sons and their friends, looking at each other and saying, man, you're in e-mode. And that was a language. They actually knew what that meant. So looking at the sheet, what's the e-mode? How would you know somebody's in e-mode? Look on their E, what does it say? They're full of energy. They're full of energy. They're driven. There's excitement everywhere. It's like, rah, 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 let's go run. Let's go run, and then two hours later, this kid needs hospitalization because he's got blisters, and he was running with the wrong shoes. You see what I'm saying? That's what happens. Oh, uh, there's enthusiasm, there's positive thinking, Ease and intuition, everything just comes so naturally. Uh, it's all driven by natural behavior, especially like there are some people that are, uh, uh, th that are uh, sociable, that talk a lot, so they verbalize it. So you hear them talking like that, like, oh, I can't wait. Let me, you know, let's go run. Uh, and it, it's all about emotions. It, there's hardly any... Pause any time, slowing down, let's see what we're doing, if we're doing it right, none of that. When you see that behavior, and this person could be your son, could be your daughter, could be your brother, could be somebody you care about. You see them behaving like that, you say, Daniel's son, relax. Have you seen the Karate Kid? No, go back and watch it. Okay, wax on, wax off. Slow them down. Now they probably want to know, what do you want me to do? You see, there's this thing called fundamental ceiling of achievement. You're going to hit it. How do you know they hit it? Because they're going to get results that are not what they expected. And they're going to show some disappointment. You see how the arrow is going down? And then there's going to be some resignation. Sounds like this. Whatever will be, will be. Okay, Sarah, Sarah. That, that's how they talk. And then what? You know what? Maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't run. Maybe I should go do boxing. So it's just, another, it's just another fad. So they go from one thing to the other to the other, constantly trying different things by energy and intuition and constantly hitting what? A ceiling. By the way, people do that in real life, not just in areas of hobbies and stuff. I know business people that do this. They go open a restaurant. Next, they fail. Then they go open. Obama, you probably know people like that. They go the one, you know. Then they open it. Oh, I make the best falafel. There was one brother. I don't even know where he is nowadays. He was from Alexandria. He made the best fish. But he knew zero about business. He made fish like they do in Alexandria. You know, uh, it has a name. In Iraq, we call it Masgouf. In Masr, we call it Singari. They make a smoke Singari. Huh? He spent $500,000 on the restaurant. Doing everything wrong had no coaching, no idea what he's doing, and then finally he crashed and burned, lost his money and everybody's money. That was an example of being entrepreneurial. Knowing how to bake fish, I know how to cook fish, but I would never attempt to be an owner of a restaurant because that's one thing and this is another. If you know how to cook, it doesn't make you a business person. Actually, I'll give you a, another example. 
one guy actually went to, uh, you know the company that changes Jiffy Loop? Jiffy Loop. So he went to Jiffy Loop, and he, it's a franchise. So he applied, I want to buy your franchise. So he says, come on down. So he goes, he sits in front of them, and they say, what makes you think that he will do good as a franchise owner? Tafadal, Akhi Anas. Tafadal, alaykum salam. Tafadal. Fi karasi andakum, shabab? Chairs in the back. Hadol adhiyuf andi fa akrimuhum, Allah khalikum. Jain min Canada, al-jama'a. My wife says to me, you have groupies following you all over. Hajjak Akhanas. Assalamu alaikum. So this guy goes to the, uh, to the regional director of the company and he says, I want to buy your Jeffy Loop. So the guy says to him, why do you think you will succeed at owning this business called Jeffy Loop? And the guy says, oh, ever since I was a kid, I've always enjoyed tinkering with cars and I would change my own oil and I would do this and I would do that. I go under the hood and then the guy said, shh, 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 stop. So he stopped. He said, we're not interested. He said, excuse me? He said, we're not looking for mechanics. We're looking for business people. You understand what I just said? It's a big difference. The guy was an E person. They're not looking for ease. They're looking for peace. They're looking for somebody who's willing to follow a system. A franchise has a business model. It has things you do. Step one, step two, step three. Has anybody here ever tinkered with franchising? You ever own a franchise or anything like that? No. Okay. I sold franchises. My job was to do the interviewing. I sat in front of people. In 2006, myself and my director, we interviewed, we, we received 300 inquiries into our franchise in 2006. 300 inquiries. You know how many passed? Went through. Ramzi approved six. I probably would have approved even less. Ramzi was my son-in-law. He was also my director. Out of 300 folks, what happened to the other 295, 94? What do you think was wrong with them? They were ease. They were ease. Okay? They were not ready to be developed. So the message today is, do you really want to succeed? Do you want to build a life on purpose? Do you want to make a difference in your life and everybody's life? Stop being an entrepreneur. Make a decision that if I want to do anything significant in my life, I have to be developed. Notice I didn't say I have to develop myself because you can't. To develop yourself means that you have the answers and you don't. And our deen is all about learning. Rasul sallallahu how many years did he spend with the Sahaba teaching them what la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah meant? How many years? 13 years. And you would say, whoa, 13 years to teach them the meaning of, yeah, because it was life-changing, life-altering. What you're looking at is just a piece of paper. But in reality, if you understand what's on this paper, it can change your life. It will make you stop doing things entrepreneurially. It will make you realize that I'm, if I'm failing at something, it's because I'm relying on my natural ability as opposed to seeking either professional help or help from somebody who is better at it than I am. And this can apply to everything from parenting, whether you're a father or mother, from teaching if you're a teacher, business if you're a business person, sports. I don't care what area of your life you're trying to develop. If you're entrepreneurial, I guarantee you you will hit that natural ceiling of achievement. And here's the problem. Some people's ceiling of achievement is higher than others. There are some that have such high natural capacity that you would think they don't have a ceiling. But at some point, they crash. I'm talking about people like Tiger Woods. You know, they would be like number one in the world, and then one day they discover that they have a handicap and they have to deal with it. And they, take, they took off for a year or two or three just to deal with that one single thing. I, I, I wish Taj Muhammad was here. 
And I wish I was interviewing her because that would be the question I would ask her. I would say to her, at what point did you realize that you have reached your natural ability, the maximum, and that you needed to be developed? And what did you do and how did you do it? And I guarantee you, no one reaches the Olympic level like that, hasn't crashed at some point, and then had somebody take them by the hand and say, hmm, you need to be developed. Watch that movie. Watch The Natural. Write it down somewhere. Uh, it's available for free on most, probably on YouTube. Okay? Robert Redford is a good guy to watch. He's an A-lister. Nowadays, he's probably in his 90s, so I think he only put out one movie recently. But in those days, he was still young, and he was good. So the movie is, is definitely worth watching. It's called The Natural. That's it. All right. So, so what does the purposeful approach look like? Okay. You go up and you see that it, it produces higher and higher levels of success. It depends on mass learning and mastery. We talked about learning. We didn't talk about mastery yet. I'll cover it next week. Learning like the type that we did last week, not learning like attending a lecture. You understand what I'm saying here? Because being purposeful alone is not enough. You have to be a learning-based person. And a learning-based person is somebody who is willing to learn at a high level. And the highest level of learning is what? Teaching. Thank you. You know what? If there is a topic that you really care about, it doesn't matter how well you know it. I don't care if it's math, physics, chemistry, tafsir. It doesn't have to be science. It could be anything. Take my word. Try it and test it. I've done it. Grab somebody and teach it to them. Start teaching them small bites. Before you know it, you'll see that you mastered that, whatever it is that you're teaching. The highest level of learning is teaching. I started teaching uh, adults about 25 years ago. And everything that I ever taught, I cannot forget even if I try. There are scripts that I taught to my salespeople 20 years ago that I can, that I can rattle right now. I can just vomit them all over the place uh, just from memory. Not that I sat there and memorized every word the way you would memorize the word, but because I taught them, it's very hard to teach something and to forget it. Okay? So that's very important. Look at the sheet in front of you. It's right up on the right corner.
look at the uh, look at the clock. Now down here, of course, the, the purposeful approach is down here. It's what you see next to the D. These are prerequisites. We didn't cover them yet. I will cover them. But in brief, in learning based, I just explained it. Mastery. Mastery is learning to never say to a sensei, a master, a trainer, a coach, to never say, teach me, teach me something new. The moment you start getting bored and you say, teach me something new, it's indicative of the fact that you're not interested in mastery. It's like, Daniel's son saying to Mr. Miyagi, what the heck am I doing? Wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off. In his mind, I'm bored. I need to do something else. In Mr. Miyagi's mind, I want to teach you to master the move so that if you have to go like this, you don't have to think. It comes naturally. It's re reflexive. It's effortless. It's all of that. This is mastery. Mastery, look, uh, we'll learn this next time, but, but I'll just... It, Say it in few words. The difference between a white belt and a black belt is almost, it's the same moves. It's the same moves. The only difference is that a white belt probably did the punch, whatever it is, the otsugi, I think they call it. They, they, they have done this maybe, I don't know, 10 times, 100 times, 150 times, still a white belt. A black belt probably did it 10,000 times. That's the difference. You think after doing a certain punch or a block, after doing it 10 times, you'll be as good as somebody who's done it 10,000 times? They estimate that it takes an Olympiad 10,000 hours of practice to reach that level. In sales, we taught our salespeople that if you want to be a multimillionaire, you need to practice certain things for a minimum of 10 years. And I, don't, I cannot forget the day late my son called me up and said, Dad, it's 10 years. I said, how do you feel? He said, wow. He, he never forgot. Now he can go against anybody. Some people that were competing with me 40 years ago, and he can give them a whooping. Why? Because he was developed. I developed him from the time he was 18. And he followed the instructions exactly the way he should. So that's what we call mastery. Mastery is not about constantly saying, teach me something new. Teach me something new. How many of you are in a, cla in a memorization class, like a Quran memorization? At least some of you. So, okay. So, so when, when you're reciting Quran and, and the sheikh or whoever is teaching you, when they say to you, uh, a certain ayah, they, they ask you to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Do you say like, oh, I'm bored. Can we go to another ayah? You don't say that. The way you learn how to recite properly is by repeating it. I learned how to recite Quran with Tajweed, with Ahkam, probably 60 years ago. I'm 67 now, 60 years ago. And I still remember them because the Sheikh Ahmed Khudr, he's still alive. He's in his mid-90s. He's still alive. I just found out he's, he's in Amman. I saw him last time I was there. He, he followed a certain method. And he would just make us repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat until we mastered the pronunciation. That's how it's done. So mastery is another requirement. We'll talk about it. You need to do something called action-focused training, which is training to take action. In other words, what I shared with you last week, not for mental pleasure, but to go home and do it. You learn by doing. You don't learn by attending a class like this one. And the next thing is, uh, is consulting. That's very advanced. That's for business people. I may not cover it here. Uh, if we have time towards the end, we'll talk about it. But then, okay, let's come to the purposeful style. The purposeful style, the first thing you need to do is what? We talked about it there. The first thing that you need to do, uh, college, uh, running, whatever. What is it called? The F word. Focus. Focus. Focus, Daniel son. You remember? Focus. Focus, Daniel son. Uh, you need to focus. And I said to you when we covered the last course that the first thing you needed to do was figure out what? 
What is the very first thing we said? You need to have a conversation with yourself. Say it loud. Your values. I have another book. So, I just got to reach my, uh, my um, so, so the first thing you need to think about and figure out is your values, right? Once you know what your values are, what do you say a value means? What's the definition of value? When somebody says my values are, what are they talking about? What's the word value? What does it mean? But how did we define values as opposed to beliefs, as opposed to a whole bunch of other words? When somebody says, these are my values, what they're saying is, don't, don't, so, close, close, something important. I mean, the, the name value gives it away. Right? So when I say my values are uh, my faith, my family, my business, you know, you, 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 you say them like that. Those are your values. What you're saying is, those are important things to me. I'm going to share a story with you that may shock you. At a time in 99, when I was operating at the highest point in my business career as a salesperson, at that time, I didn't own anything. I was just a salesman. A company from Texas that was developing, it was new, Found out about me. They invited me down to Texas. I went there. I met with the CEO. She said, we understand you're the top guy in New Jersey. I'm like, yep. She's like, that's why we want to talk to you. She's like, okay. She's like my mother. Okay, we sat there. She said, let me share with you. Our values, our family, good, and business. And I'm like, hmm, those are my values. <laughs> she said, then we're a match. I said, yes, we are. Wallahi, that's how I got in business with them. Would you believe that? Based on those three things. She said, our values are our family, God, in that order. She's a Southern Baptist. What do you expect? My, uh, my values are God, family, and business. I said, my values are God, family, and business in the same order. She said, then we're a match. I said, yes, we are. Let's get in business. You see how important values are? That somebody at the highest point in his life, folks, let me give you an idea what that was like. I don't mind to share with you. That was longer. We're talking 99. So that's, what, 24 years ago? That year, I made a half a million dollars in commissions. Now, you make that kind of money. Would you, would you risk quitting and going trying something different? How many would do that? It was a major, major, major decision in my life. My wife, my kids are in college. I mean, things were happening. And I get to make such a huge decision in my life because I found somebody who was a match, a value match to me. Listen, if you're single and you're about to get married, Find somebody who's a value match. Everything else will fall in place. Find somebody who's a value match. Somebody who, 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 to, to whom faith is Allah is number one. Somebody who cares about his family. And by the way, there are ways to test that. You know, you can ask questions. You can check around. There's so many ways, but verify and the last thing would be, you know, the usual stuff, the car, the house, the, yeah. Go ahead, uh, so, sorry. I thought you had it. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So you want to comment? Oh, okay. I thought you had a question. So, so, so values are very important. But if you have too many values, what do we say you need to do? You need to prioritize. Because if they are all over the place, they get to prioritize themselves in spite of you.
So one day you wake up and number two became number one, and then the next day number three is number one. You don't want that. You want to prioritize them and hold on to that. So, so if you say God is my number one, make sure it stays number one. I don't mind that past number two, like God and family, that uh, you make a choice between business and health. <laughs> say you woke up one day and you're sick. Do you say, oh, I can't, I can't not go to my restaurant. I'll lose money. Okay. The day after that, you'll go to the ICU. Because you had pneumonia and you didn't take care of it, and now you're on your deathbed. Would you want that? So uh, you, all you have to do is push business down, bring health up. So now health is your number three. And you call your wife and say, honey, I, you got to check myself in. It looks like I'm in trouble. That's, that's what prioritizing means. Normally, they don't change that easily, especially if, if you're aware of them. So you prioritize. But we said once you prioritize, what do you have to do? And that's why I brought this up, this example up. What's the next most important step after you prioritize? No, once you decide what number one is, what do you do? You focus. You can't focus unless you know what's your number one. And we said number one, number two is a distraction until you accomplish number one. I hope you remember that. You see, if you remember that, you would get two books, not just one. Because that's advanced level. So you focus. And that's what we're talking about. Focus is the first step in the purposeful approach. Once you focus on what you want to do, then the next step is just read it off the list. What do you do? You look for a model. Uh, you look at options. And, and you're looking at options so that you can pick a model. You pick a model so you can learn how to get it done. And then you set up some accountability, talk to Allah, and you go do it. And hopefully success will be yours. I'm done. Jazakum Allah khairan for listening. If anybody has a question, I'll take, we're past, two minutes past. Uh, in three minutes, anybody has a question or comment? Fadrikh. Relax, relax. We're not done yet. Yeah. That's a good question. He's saying that some of the members of Congress and Senate or whatever, they are like way out in left field. Like they're not even borderline. Uh, I, look, I don't mean to depress you, but out of 435 members of Congress, there's only 18 on our side. 18 out of 435. So if we follow that logic, then we shouldn't. But, however... There is mechanisms in place. Remember, I studied public administration. That, that's, that's my area of specialty. In public administration, these people are elected officials. Elected officials are required to stay in touch with their constituents. And if they don't, and if the constituents reach to them, they're supposed to keep track of comments on public matters. And this is definitely a public issue. It has to do with allocation of money and billions of dollars, weapons, and all of that. So they are, by law, required to keep track of the responses. Okay? And I know that because there are st some studies that have been done that track how the Congress person votes versus where the community is. How would they know where the community preferences are if they didn't have the calls to analyze. So they have the data, they collect the data, they analyze the data, then they look at where the congressperson voted and they match them up. And historically, it's been shown that members of Congress are not in sync with their constituents. So there is evidence already, not because of Gaza, historically, that they are bad, bad actors, okay? But that doesn't mean we cannot call them. It means we know you're a bad actor. We know you're not going to listen to us. But we're still going to put you on the record as being opposite to your constituents' uh, beliefs. Okay, so we do our job. Leave the rest to Allah. And to you, you, you get the ajr for making the call. Don't worry about what happens as a result of the call. Leave that to Allah. Your job and my job is to do what we're supposed to do. We'll back on Allah. From the sisters, any question or comment? Type. Yeah. Yeah.
we can. No, no, wait. I'll be out of town anyway. I'm, I'm going to be at the AMP conference convention. So, so. <laughs> uh, AMP, AMP has, uh, has their annual conference. I attend it every year. It's going to be in Chicago. I, I don't know if, 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 if there's enough time. I mean, plane tickets are now over $1,000. Yeah. It, it's a great conference to attend. I mean, wallahi, you feel like you are in heaven. You know, when, when you're, there is entertainment, there's an ashid, there is dabke, there is a huge bazaar, and there are speakers, there are really big names. That's where I got to meet Miko Pellet, the gen, general's son, uh, uh, Ilan Pepe, uh, the guy, uh, Jadon Levy from Haaretz. I mean, all these big names that you only read about uh, uh, on Facebook pages and so on. I got to meet them person to person to buy their book and get their autograph, sit down and have a, an actual real conversation with a celebrity that people would love to talk to. Uh, I, I found out Miko Pellet knows my village. He knows where my grandfather's house is. And he is a really, really nice guy who actually feels with us and feels for us. And, and, and he shared his phone number with me, and we exchanged messages. The point I'm trying to say is you expand your horizon. If you can't go this year, plan to go next year, inshallah, and I'd love to see you there. Jazakum la khair. So this week, this coming week, there's no class. We'll meet the week after, inshallah. And I hope between now and then that you get your hand out because I want to.